And people came to America looking for their pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Crammed on boats to live stacked and packed in poverty in the new world from all over the old world. With names like Putkowski, Piacentino, and Gershowitz. Such a costly, risky journey to an entirely new beginning in a strange and foreign land was a supreme vote of confidence in America. If it wasn't the land of opportunity, believe me, they were going to make it be. And within a generation of getting off boats in the land of trains, they were writing anthems that touched the core of our national soul. God bless America. Irving Berlin didn't have to distance himself from himself to be accepted here. And other great American songwriters of every ethnicity created a superbly crafted body of song that reiterated all the great American essences. These composers cemented our relationship to a European song tradition that was already in the bedrock of American music. English hymns were sung all over this country. In New Orleans, so many Italian, French, and Spanish songs. Irish music with its American accent coming from every fiddle, as well as a nationwide adoption of a German style of education that gave music, believe it or not, a prominent role. So as President Woodrow Wilson was busy segregating our federal government, American songwriters were figuring out how to integrate everything they wrote. In most instances, American pop songs were written by professionals who were still interested in competing with the ways of the old world. They were determined to prove that their lives in America were not only financially successful, but artistically significant. So, the harmonies and melodies of their songs showed the influence of old Bach and Schubert and Wagner and all the other big boys from Europe. But the rhythm was America. The wave of late 19th century immigrants and their children who enriched the American popular songbook were outsiders who brought fresh dreams and a re-envisioning of American fundamentals. The American popular songbook was a national blood transfusion. These songs came to define modern romance. But because people left farms and became anonymous in the city, because of dances like the fox trot and the turkey trot and every other thing named with an animal. The Charleston, because of prohibition, because of the ascending recording and publishing industry, because people could play pianos and were well educated in music, because more freedom led to a less Victorian way of love, and because men and women like dancing close and were going to do it anyway. The American songwriter gave the world a treasure trove of works, the diversity of which was unprecedented and inconceivable. And when these songs met jazz musicians, the sensuousness of brushes on drums and horns softly and sweetly swinging created a juggernaut of love expression that swept the country. The best of these songs and the jazz played on them put the common touch on the deepest levels of human truth. In spite of the diversity and quality of our music, America still suffered under a cultural inferiority complex about Europe. But when the operettas of Victor Herbert merged with the vaudeville productions of George M. Cohan, merged with the elevated production standards of men like Flo Ziegfeld, America's answer to the opera was born, the Broadway musical. And Gershwin and Ellington aspired to create a new style of American orchestral music that could be both sophisticated and popular and they were not alone. Many composers were concerned with reaching deeper in the hearts and minds of the common American without sacrificing the craft of music. They were the common man, and we loved their songs. And everywhere there was a piano and a gathering, those songs were played. Singers like Frank Sinatra and Billie Holiday, who carried the pain, triumph, and vulnerability of romance in their sounds, sang iconic songs like I'll be loving you always, and I did it my way. As scores of musicians played in their way and only their way. And Louis Armstrong taught everyone how to play and sing like Americans. And he said, I got a right to sing the blues. And we did. Songs like Taking a Chance on Love spoke to an individual's pluck and the fact that freedom was an opportunity, not a destination. And that's only what Oliver Wendell Holmes had told you in 1919. Competition was at the heart of the Constitution. 
and the opportunity to compete on a level playing field was all you could ask. Competition led Benny Goodman to hire Fletcher Henderson to write black arrangements for his white band. Because no one could see the arranger, the audience didn't know that Goodman's performance of Blue Skies was the melting pot. They didn't even think about that. They just kept on dancing. What that music said about the possibilities of our country living its creed so moved Benny Goodman, he was called to integrate his band and deal with all the problems that came with exercising the right to be free. And when all those bands and musicians from Frank Trombauer to Coleman Hawkins to Marcus Roberts to Mark O'Connor improvised variations on George Gershwin's I Got Rhythm, they are affirming the ongoing Americanness of the flexible, standardized form, that basic, repeated grid that we talked about earlier that inspires you to create endless personal variations without faltering. And Charlie Parker swang on that same flexible grid as he took us to the digital age in 1945 when he mastered the complex harmonies on Ray Noble's Cherokee while still managing to play blues in time at cyber speed. 